Cool. So I'm here. Well, as the sign says, I'm here to talk about uh, asynchronous JavaScript patterns. This is going to be the most boring presentation because I'm going to just keep reading from the slides. No, I'm joking. Why, why would I do that? I would just <laughs> anyway. So. Um, uh, and this, I'm talking about this because um, you know I have been a client side developer for almost all of my career. Uh, unlike uh, uh, you know, unlike Dhananjay, I have not been a polyglot. I've been a one-trick pony. Uh, so that's the only thing I can do. I can only write JavaScript as code, or I can do. Um, but uh, you know, being a client side developer, you know, and I've lived through all of the cycles that he was talking about. So I was sort of feeling all nostalgic and stuff. But you know, romantic times with Dojo and. Uh, prototype and stuff like that, and you know, finally the hatred that I have for jQuery. I hate jQuery, but you know, that's just me. Um, and um, and uh, you know, and then Node comes along, and then Node changes. Uh, you know, suddenly there's this mind share that Node gets, which uh, which clients at JavaScript did not get. You know, there was just not enough smart people. There were people like me doing clients at JavaScript, not enough smart people doing clients at JavaScript, right? So. Uh, so there had to be, you know, something big that happened in JavaScript, and Node was that, where then people could then, you know, jump in with ideas about how to make things better, uh, and that has sort of influenced, started influencing client-side development as well. So what I'm talking about is about how to deal with async patterns, um, and how sort of Node has taught uh, the client side how to do uh, async patterns well, and that's you know that's roughly the talk, uh, the summary of the talk. Uh, about me already, uh, uh, Kiran's made the pitch. I, I didn't have to do this. Uh, I uh, I've been doing JavaScript for about nine plus years. That's uh, sadly that's almost like eighty percent of the lifetime of JavaScript mm -hmm. itself. That's you know pretty sad. And I'm like been doing that for so long. Um, I'm obsessed with clean code. Uh, I you know I take a lot of pride in in uh, in my code being clean. Uh, and I like robots. I've not been able to add lasers to them yet, but I've been able to add, you know, work with robots. It's good fun. We, sh we should chat up later if you want about, you know, how, how uh, we can build robots with JavaScript. I'll be in fact showing this off at JSFU in Bangalore. So, you know, maybe if anyone of you is coming along there, then we could have a look at there. Have you, have you put a robot on a shark yet? No, not a robot on a shark yet, no. But I'm thinking of putting a cat that can fly, you know, the ones. <laughs> um, so, you know, I want to sort of backtrack, uh, and I know, you know, Dhananjay has done this as well, but I want to just step back and, you know, go over a couple of points really quick before I jump into async. Um, uh, and the first thing I want to talk about is JavaScript itself, JavaScript, the language, right? Um, so JavaScript is a very small language, uh, and by small, I mean the amount of keywords, the amount of constructs, uh, the amount of uh, syntax you have to deal with, you know, stuff like that is a rather small language. Uh, there are languages that are much, much vaster than JavaScript in terms of its keywords and constructs, but JavaScript is not that. It's very small. Uh, contrary to popular belief, JavaScript is actually a sequential programming language. A lot of people think it's an asynchronous programming language. There's nothing about JavaScript that makes it asynchronous. Uh, this is a controversial statement uh, because everybody else seems to see, think that JavaScript is, is asynchronous. It is not. It's a synchronous programming language. It goes, you know, statement after statement after statement. That's how it works. And while it's doing that, uh, you know, there's nothing else that can run. That's how JavaScript works, right? So it's a single threaded. It's single threaded, and there's it, no multiprocessing it, at all. There is no multiprocessing at all. You know, it's a small language. Let's just say that's the beauty of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, the only time when, of course, it does not go sequentially is when something breaks the control flow, and that would be something like, you know, an if statement or a for loop or you know, a function call or something. You know, just as you would expect in any typical language. So that is that is how JavaScript is. It's not very hard to understand. In fact, it's comparable to anything else like, you know, Python or what have you uh, in, in terms of the flow of code, right? It just flows from top to bottom unless there is somewhere to branch out at. Uh, so, you know, yeah, so control flow could uh, break the sequence. Uh, this is a very popular photograph. I don't know if you guys have seen this. This JavaScript, the definitive guide, which is the fat book at the bottom. This JavaScript, the good parts, <laughs> the thin one. Uh, so, you know, I, I will admit JavaScript is not very, uh, not very, uh, you know, cool. But then, fortunately, um, there is also uh, Brendan Eich, who is our uh, messiah, uh, the creator of JavaScript. Uh, he also, fortunately, has a very good sense of humor. So, at a talk that he was giving recently, uh, he he put up a slide as a joke uh, to counter this and to counter Douglas Crawford, he put up a slide saying JavaScript the best parts, right? And so that's, this is what he listed out. 
and he said that you know this is this is what this is what JavaScript is basically three bullet points. That's all that, you know. That's all that is required uh, to make JavaScript work, and that's the only thing exciting about JavaScript, right? And so functions as first class objects, uh, closures and prototypal inheritance. Uh, I will not be diving into closures and prototypal inheritance. Uh, already, you know, he's he's gone over prototypal inheritance in some amount already. Uh, and I, but I will be looking at functions in some amount of detail, though, you know, I don't think half an hour I'll be able to do justice to it. I can count at least seven different ways of using functions in JavaScript, you know, it's, functions are very, very powerful in JavaScript. But before we come to that, uh, remember I told you JavaScript is uh, sequential. Uh, it is the host environment that JavaScript is running in. I want to distinguish the two, right? There is the language and then there is the environment that the language runs in. Uh, the environment that the language runs in is usually interesting with JavaScript if it has an event loop. Though it is not necessary for the host environment to have an event loop, right? So, uh, most interesting host environments, for example, the browser and Node.js, which are the two most uh, popular uh, environments for uh, JavaScript, actually have an event loop in them. And, you know, that's, that's what is interesting, uh, that's what makes JavaScript interesting in those places. Though of course it's not necessary, I, you know, Jaxer used to be a programming language that was a, a programming environment that had JavaScript as its host. I've actually programmed in this on, uh, you know, building something that never really took off. But uh, uh, that did not have uh, an event loop working in it. You can also script Photoshop if you didn't know. Uh, and, you know, Vishal who was supposed to be with us uh, today but had to go on a personal engagement. That guy is doing some crazy stuff with his Photoshop. He's like, he scripted the... You know, he's, I should not be using these words here, but he scripted that thing. <laughs> he scripted that thing very, very well to the extent that he can save something in in his editor, uh, and then that will update something in Photoshop, cut that up into images, which then will be exported onto his file system, and then cause a browser reload to happen just by hitting save in his editor. Right? So he just he's just scripted this thing out so beautifully. It's amazing. So uh, uh, you know, I hope that we could you know uh, he's coming down to, to Bangalore again. Because he pitched a reception for me, I'm going to pitch Bangalore for him, right? So he's coming down to Bangalore, so you know you should probably catch him if you can. Um, uh, Vishal, Vishal. <laughs> all right. So uh, all right. Let me let me talk about one more thing. Now, a lot of people uh, mistakenly think that set timeouts. Everyone's familiar with set timeout, I'm sure, right? Uh, a lot of people think set timeout is something that JavaScript gives them. It is not. Set timeout is something the host environment gives them. It's actually the browser that is providing set timeout. JavaScript does not, because set timeout has to work with the event loop, uh, whereas JavaScript is not aware of the event loop, right? There is no such concept of an event loop in JavaScript. It's the browser that's providing it. So set timeout is an example that is that is so intertwined <coughs> with JavaScript because we you know so just used so used to it in the browser uh, that we think is part of JavaScript. It isn't. Set timeout is, has something has has to do with the event loop. Now you know. Uh, I'm sure you could probably figure out what this code does. Uh, it prints hello, it waits for five seconds, and then it prints world, right? And we could probably just give it a spin right here, if this works. Right, so it says hello, waits for a little time, and then world, right? So. Um, what now? This is expected. What I want to like impress upon you, though, is the fact that uh, by saying by calling set timeout, what I have done is I have essentially passed this block of code, that function that says world. I have passed it this block of code, and I have told it to put this code on the event loop to be executed five seconds later. To roughly, you know, this is not absolutely accurate, but roughly speaking, this is what I'm doing, right? Uh, so I'm saying take this block of code which is power number one of JavaScript, you are passing it blocks of code as opposed to passing it, you know, strings or numbers or whatever. You're passing it blocks of code and you're telling it, take this and run this, put this on the event loop to be run five seconds later, right? Now, it does not actually go out to the event loop right then and there because your code is executing sequentially. So your, your, your process is busy, right? It's going sequentially. There is no, it does not actually go out to the event loop. It's after it alerts, hello, does it then go to the event loop, schedules it over there, waits for five seconds and then comes back, right? With me so far? Lost? Why, okay. Uh, why after alert hello does it go to? Sorry? If, if it goes sequentially, uh, if the set time out should happen first and then. Right, but it has to go out to the event loop. So in a, it depends on environments. And in most environments, what happens is that since it has to go out to the event loop, that is actually, that process is also scheduled on the event loop itself. 
So in this case, it has to wait for five seconds. So that, that process is actually scheduled on the event loop. For, for that to happen, so an easy way to test this is like, for example, let's say you want to make an Ajax call. An Ajax call is something that has to go to an event loop, right? Uh, so you, let's say, fire off an Ajax call, and then you keep the browser stuck for some time. You know, just, just keep it in a loop. You will see the Ajax call does not even reach your server. It will not because it is not actually scheduled on the event loop yet. It's when your event loop is when your event loop is free, when your when your JavaScript runtime is not doing anything, is when it will actually get time to play with the event loop. So that's how the browser is sort of marrying the runtime and the language, right? Uh, you see, essentially the yield is cooperative. Yes, 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 roughly, yes. Or uh, probably you are saying that you are not saying that execute this after five seconds. You are saying that try to execute this after five seconds if you are free. Yes, yes, absolutely. So there is no guarantee, obviously, okay. that after five seconds it will be free. It could just be that your event loop is or your your JavaScript runtime has caught the process and is not letting the process leave. So it does not interrupt the middle of the Right, right, right. Okay, so there are a couple of people here who seem to have understood. I don't know the rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Still good. Cool. So the lack of interruptions also means that globals are in a problem for events. In a sense that um, the fact that you have global state right. uh, doesn't really come back and hurt you with something like this. Yeah, I mean this would not have anything to do with globals at all. Yeah. Um, well, another example is that what if I make this zero? Ah, now I figured it out. You have tap disabled, but I don't. Oh, never mind. Okay, so let's say I make this zero. Uh, which, which essentially is saying that you know set timeout zero, which says execute this immediately, right? Because the delay is now made zeros. You know, execute this immediately. Uh, but even then, when I when I run this, you will say that it prints hello first. Why does it do that when I have told it to execute world immediately? It's uh, because it has to go out to the event loop, right? You're saying uh, execute this when you are free. Exactly, exactly. So that's why that happens, right? So, uh, so. You know, with me so far? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so why is this exciting? You know, everybody seems to be crazy about the event loop. Why is this exciting? First of all, this is perfect for UIs. In fact, and maybe because I'm dumb, but I, I don't know of any other way to do UI programming other than event loops. When you're talking about GUI programming, at least, I, I can't think, and maybe just because I don't know enough, but I can't think of any other way to do GUI programming other than using event loops. You don't want, obviously, you don't want your processor to be, you know, stuck doing nothing all the time. Whereas your app is, is there, it's on the UI and it's doing nothing most of the time, right? The app is doing nothing. But you want to be interrupted whenever the user does something. So the event loop is just perfect for that. Um, and, you know, on the server, everyone, this is the regular node chant, so everyone's heard this. Uh, most apps are just waiting for a connection to come in, then they have to go and query the database, so they're waiting for the database. Then you know they are probably get some templates from disk and they're waiting for that to come through. And only after that do they prepare a web page. So this is the node mantra, right? Saying that most of the time your app is doing nothing. And so you know, let's try to use that wasted time to do something better. And event loops turn out to be you know great solutions to fix that. It's not the only solution, uh, it's a solution. There are other solutions as well. Uh, but you know that's the op that's the option that uh, that node happened to pick, and the reason they picked this is sort of twofold. One is because we can pass functions around, which is just very very elegant in node in JavaScript, uh, and secondly because there is a huge uh, a number of people who are already used to doing this on in the browser already. So you know the, the learning curve is sort of easier uh, when it comes to server side JavaScript, right? So I want to come back to functions. Functions. Uh, uh, you know, the Lisper used to have this thing called Lambda the Ultimate. I don't know what the, the, there he is, the Lisper. <laughs> right, Lambda the Ultimate. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, and this, this is the, the only aspect of functions that I'm really going to be talking about, though. But the ability to pass functions around, uh, all the jQuery guys must be familiar with this dollar dot click and you pass it a function. Essentially, what you're doing is, you know, here, take this block of code, do not run this right now, wait for this thing to happen. And when that happens, when you get that message on your event loop, at that time use this use this function to you know do what you have to do, right? Uh, so that's that's what you're doing over here, which is a very powerful idea yet so simply expressed, right? Uh, this is another another pattern. So this is a pattern where you're passing a function into another function. Uh, dollar dot click is a function. You're passing it another function. Here, uh, dollar dot ajax again something that uh, that jQuery guys must be pop, uh, familiar with is where you are passing it a function as part of an object literal, slightly different, uh, you know, slight, slight variation on the same theme. Uh, 
and then there are uh, the node guys who are who are probably seeing patterns like this. Uh, yeah, the text wrapping went crazy, but uh, you know, so you must have seen patterns like this where you are basically saying get a file name. Uh, you know, I want to read this file where that's the file name. Uh, and when that file, when after you have done going out to the disk, seeking, getting the contents, after you finished all of that, call this function to uh, to do you know whatever you have to do, right? So uh, so so basically, the idea of passing functions around seems to be a, a very sort of common thread among all of these guys. Uh, and so the Node guys decided that you know if we have a standard way to do this, there's a lot of funky stuff we can do. So let's try to figure out a standard way of doing this. And they came up with uh, this it's called CPS uh, or continuation passing style. I don't know why it's called that. I think it's because of the the idea that you know, your code sort of continues where it had left off the last time. I think that's why it is, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so continuation passing style, where uh, you know, let's say that so uh, at the bottom there, uh, I've got a function called make async call where I'm passing it, you know, value one and value two. It does not matter what they are, and uh, the important thing though is that I'm passing the values or the regular arguments of the function first. Then I'm passing the callback that has to be called, uh, which is the last argument to the function. And within that callback, I always get the error object, which is the first argument of the callback, right? Node guys just decided it's it's a good idea if we stick to the standard. The implementation of this would be, you know, where you've got uh, something like that, and you basically at some point when you are finished doing your asynchronous stuff. You call the callback that has been passed in, uh, either passing it an error if there was an error, or passing it null if there was no error, and you pass it you know as much amount of data that you want. The key aspects, though, uh, oh, this is an example. Uh, one more example. Let me see if I can. It's too small now, isn't it? Is that visible? Not visible. All right. So the wrapping will have to happen, I guess. Uh, so this is an example where you know you want to request some URL. Uh, and uh, you pass it a function that uh, will do something with the response of that URL, right? Very simple pattern. Uh, again, to reiterate, all the arguments that you want to pass, in this case the URL, is passed in first. And uh, the, the callback is the last argument that you are passing into the function. And within the callback, the first argument to that is always the error, right? Um, so I just sort of listed out what I've talked about so far. So it takes all arguments first, the last argument should be the callback, it passes an error as the first argument to the callback, and then the remaining argument should be whatever data if there is any to be passed into the callback, right? A uh, couple of reasons why this is a huge hit. For me, one thing, I, you know, I'm a very sloppy programmer sometimes, as much as I said that I take pride, that was just to impress you, honestly, I'm a very sloppy programmer. Uh, and I don't do a lot of uh, error catching sometimes, right? I just, like, I fail at that, and my servers have crashed because of this a lot of times. Um, but the node style forces you to think about errors because you are always taking that error as your first argument. You have to do something with it now, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it forces you to think about errors. I like that, you know. And so it, I, I feel that uh, uh, my code is somehow like you know more resilient uh, because of this pattern. Uh, question: So uh, if you have, if you want to pass in some state right. into the callback, right? Uh, how do you do that? You can't. So usually that's done by closures. You yeah, so yeah. So it's not actually closure. passed into the. Or so you can bind. Closure. Yeah, it's usually done by closures. Or you can bind it. Of course, you can bind it to a scope. You can bind the function to a scope if you want to. Uh, any? Feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. What about binding to a scope? Uh, that is funky. <laughs> Basically, you're taking the this of the function and attaching that to an object and then you can access the this as well. Uh, that's, that's a huge discussion by itself, we could talk about that separately. <coughs> um, Alright, I'm going to talk about ugliness. This is the problem with continuation passing style. I'm sorry I'm zooming out slightly but I think it will probably help understand. Um, uh, you know, the example over here, what it's doing is it's trying to read two files, do something with it and write a third file. That's what this is doing, right? So you can see that's reading file one, then it's reading file two, then it's writing to the file, and you know that's how it looks. Apparently, in my language, returns can be capital, uh, but you know whatever. Um, so, and this uh, this is generally how your Node programs look if you're a bad programmer like me, uh, and that's why this has got an actual name for it. It's got a name. It's called callback hell. 
because you're constantly passing callback after callback after callback, you know. And uh, uh, obviously, a lot of people who come to Node, this is the first thing that they complain about is that you know this callback hell. I don't want to like who's this is the ugliest form of programming I've ever seen. Who wants to deal with this kind of programming, right? Uh, turns out they are right. You know, they are not wrong. Uh, but there are ways to deal with it. Um, for example, there is this framework called async that I use a lot. It's about the same code. In fact, it's slightly faster, if anything. Uh, but it's doing exactly the same thing as this slide, right? And so what it's doing is it's parallelly fetching file one and file two, and then when that's done, it's writing that out to uh, to a file, right? So uh, it, the actual library code does not actually matter. The idea is that I wanted to show you that it's possible to make things uh, things uh, look simpler, right? Wow, lots of things. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Uh, wouldn't it be easy, wouldn't that callback help hmm. so called be made to seem a lot simpler if you just declared each of the functions standard yeah, sure, sure. Uh, but you would I think most of it is because you're declaring the function right there right. at the point of uh, right. where you're uh, kind of using it correct correct so uh, yeah I mean it still needs to be done sort of smartly because you have to ensure that you are uh, you know because declaring functions does not let you get take care of the depth, right? So you're still having to go deeper and deeper inside, unless you decide that you want to like branch off the writing and do that as well, branch off, you know. So it has to be done sort of smartly. Uh, though of course I'm sure that people who have a knack to do it will be able to figure it out well. But you know, usually a newcomer who's coming in will complain saying that I don't know how to how to make sense of this, right? Go ahead. Uh, can you just go to the next screen? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so here uh, this this would work only if the two functions are independent of each other. So if I right. I have to read from first file and then do something with second one. Right. So right. then it won't work for me. Right? Correct. So that's because I'm choosing to do it parallelly over here. Right. There are there is async dot series as well that lets you go sequentially function okay. after function. So after the first one completes, go to the second one and third one and so on. So you can control that behavior uh, as you as you please. Right. Um, so it's sort of cleaner. Uh, I have only sort of looked at the top. Uh, parts of the code and made it slightly cleaner, uh, but you know here's another variation of that again using async. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Great question. The event loop, how it is. Right, right. So what happens is that async dot parallel starts. Uh, you are giving it an array. It starts processing this array internally. Uh, the array has got uh, two functions. Uh, and it starts executing the first function. Uh, it cannot execute both the functions parallelly because JavaScript is single thread, right? So it's, it starts executing the first function. The first function is doing fs dot uh, read file. Uh, so now obviously this process has to go over to the event loop because reading the file is not something that's done inside the JavaScript uh, runtime. It, or sorry, not inside the JavaScript language. It has to go over to the event loop. So it schedules the read of this file onto the event loop. Now, now suddenly the event loop is is free. Uh, but you know, async is now going to try executing the second function. So now the second function executes, and that's that's going to that's also asking to read a file. So the second file is also scheduled onto the event loop. So now both the functions parallelly are cause have caused the event loop to get scheduled, right? And so whenever they will return, they will you know they will return out of time. It might the order might not matter. We don't know at that point of time. And whenever they are completed, async figures out that they are completed together, and we can go over how that happens. But async figures out that they're completed together, and then at the end we'll call that last function that we have passed in. So it's essentially both of them scheduling stuff at the event loop one after another, and then it could happen out of order or you know in order or whatever. We can't we can't be sure about that, and then it will return whenever it's done. Right. Um, you know, Dhananjay was talking about uh, about functional programming, and I have just you know recently started falling in love with it. It's it's absolutely elegant. Uh, I just love how you know you can just use uh, and async lets you do this in uh, uh, over so async the library lets you do this over the event loop so you can actually do functional programming using the event loop that's actually a lot of fun so here I've got two files that I'm just saying you know I'm mapping over them and I'm saying fs dot read file you know it's that simple it's just done. two files are ready <laughs> very elegant <laughs> right and then when they are done the third the callback is called it's just beautiful. Um, so anyway, so that's that's uh, that's about CPS. But CPS is not you know, it's not the solution to everything. Uh, it's great when you want to do one thing 
and you want to do it once. You know, that's it's awesome in that kind of a scenario. But it sort of sucks when you want to do something repeatedly, uh, and it also sucks when you have to do the same when that same thing could have several outcomes. Like you call a function that could have several different things that could happen. Uh, you know, and, and uh, CPS does not really help very well over there. Uh, so obviously there was there was an alternative pattern that was created. Uh, and you know, in the very early days of Node, I actually used to participate in the IRC uh, rooms. Uh, and you know, as this, as these things usually go, you go there with an opinion, and you just, like strongly defend your opinion. And then you discover that you are a fool because they're just so much smarter than you. Uh, so that that sort of happened. Uh, and and you know, ultimately, this pattern is what won. It's called event emitters, uh, and you know, it's it's a very fancy name, but really, there are only two functions that you need to care about. One is dot on. And the other is dot emit. Um, dot on uh, actually used to be called add listener at one time because it was sort of uh, you know it was adapted from the browser, uh, so it used to be called add listener. But add listener is just now sort of uh, it's renamed to on, or actually both of them are just pointing to each other. Um, and then there is emit. Uh, as a consumer of something, as a user of something that is that is using event emitters, you actually don't need to use emit uh, usually. So most of the times you are only really using one function. You're only using on. Um, so let's look at an example of uh, let's look at an example of that. Uh, here I'm, I'm creating an HTTP server, and uh, you know every time a request comes in, that that function is going to be called. The lambda is going to be called. Uh, and you know if you look at the first request dot on data, that's the example where I'm using the the event emitter pattern. Uh, I get a chunk of data repeatedly over. So this is an example. You could imagine that this is an example of say uploading a file or something, right? So you've got a huge video which is say one gig or something, and you're uploading that to the server. Um, so uh, you know that will be will be passed on in chunks because that's how TCP works and stuff, right? So you will get chunks and chunks of data, um, and so each time you get a chunk, the on data event will be fired. Uh, that's what it's. That's the terminology. The on data event will be fired, which essentially means that. If you have a listener that is listening to data like how we have over here, then that function will be called every time uh, that a data chunk appears, right? Uh, similarly, end is something that could happen uh, when the stream is complete. And error could happen if there was some problem in the transmission, right? So here's an example of something that is actually having three different behaviors. One of giving you chunks, the second of actually stopping the stream, and the third of possibly having an error in the stream. And so event emitters are great for that, right? Am I? How bad am I on time? Ten minutes more. Pretty good. Okay. So, um, so you know, this, this is another pattern to use, right? Go ahead. Is there an advantage here that mm -hmm. uh, in the earlier uh, callback style, right. you actually had were encoding expected sequence of how this code was supposed to right. behave, right. whereas this is sequence now data end and error could come in any sequence, right? And your code is no longer making those assumptions, right. which it would have had to earlier, right? Uh, yeah, so it turns out, and you know, unfortunately, to add to the complication, the fact that in CPS the, it's so elegant in terms of it's sort of understood that the last argument has to be a function, you know, stuff like that. Here, the event names are not standardized as well, so you know, there are some uh, there is some dissonance that is happening. It's not very easy to use uh, event emitters. There are there are problems. I I don't know if that was your question. No, actually, I was. Uh, I thought this was a big plus for event emitters. Oh, okay. That you did no longer have to sequence out stuff saying first oh. do handle data, then handle end, then handle error. You are right. basically saying whatever shape and yeah. order it yeah. comes in. Yeah, totally. Now, I thought so, this is a plus for you. Oh yeah, I mean so that's that's the reason why it was it was created, of course. So you know the fact that things could happen in any way and any order and uh, and you know there could be entirely different things that are happening simultaneously, or not simultaneously, but you know very close to each other, and you'd you'd be able to handle them within the same uh, you know same block of code at least. So that's definitely a plus for your request. Okay. Um, all right. Any questions so far on event emitters? Uh, isn't this same uh, the same programming paradigm is used in Socket.io as well, where you have? Yes. Yes, you're right. In fact. And socket.io, even on the client, I believe you use the same. Yeah, the same. Yeah. So it's a great example of where an idea from Node crossed over, crossed over, and went to the client. And you know, is the same pattern being used on on the client as well. There was some question over there. Exactly the same. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So that's an example where you know an idea sort of uh, went from the server to the client. It's, it's very interesting. Um, 
So you know, uh, obvious obvious candidates for emitting events are uh, you know TCP and UDP sockets. Uh, files uh, as you are reading chunks of files again, you know that's an example. Uh, and HTTP requests we just saw in the previous case. Um, so you know these are typical cases where event emitters are used. Uh, but unfortunately, since just there's just so much code to be written to use an event emitter, you know there are there are things like the read file function that I showed you, which is generally the thing that you want. You know, in, in a lot of cases, is that you know just go fetch the contents of this file for me and give it to me. So sometimes you know people have created functions that sort of do all of these complications internally and give you just one chunk in the end, you know, because it's sort of more convenient that way, right? Uh, before I proceed, it's the same exact same code uh, from last time, but you know, can you think of any problem with this code other than the fact that? Uh, can you think of any problem? It's a problem that you know chunks will not get garbage. I mean, chunks will keep on holding nothing. Absolutely. On error. Absolutely. So what happens is that let's say you're uploading somebody is uploading a five giga five GB file to your server. Your server only has one GB of uh, of RAM. Uh, you know your disk will just, your your server will start swapping uh, and it will eventually crash. And that's because you know chunks are keeping on getting accumulated uh, in memory and you know it will not be released until you're actually doing something in the end, you know, you're just keeping on adding that up, right? So that, that starts getting, uh, uh, that starts becoming a huge memory overhead. Um, so, you know, the solution obviously is to avoid buffering, that, that is classic buffering that we were doing there. The solution is of course to avoid the buffering. So rather than waiting for end to fire, uh, you call, uh, you do something right when you are receiving each chunk of data, rather than, you know, trying to wait for collecting all the data together, you just do it in chunks, right? Uh, for example, um, let's say that you are having a file upload happening and you want to write uh, that file to your server to the disk. Uh, you could just, as you get a chunk, you just write that into a file and you know just keep doing this one after the other. So you don't have to hold this in memory, you can just keep flushing it instantly, right? So that's one way to uh, avoid buffering. Now it turns out, this pattern is actually rather common in, in uh, JavaScript. Is in, in Node, people started discovering that they're doing this actually very, very frequently. So uh, you know they decided that this has to be formalized as well, and as as recently as 0.4, I think in Node is where they started talking about this, um, and so you know they decided they have to formalize it, they have to make it easier, give it a better API, make it easier to write, uh, and so streams was born. Uh, I have paraphrased, and I'm probably going to misattribute, but I think this is by. Uh, by Isaacs. Isaac is the uh, current maintainer of the uh, Node project. Uh, but yeah, that's what he said. He said streams are so awesome, they alone justify the existence of Node. That is how awesome streams are, right? Like everything that has been done in Node until streams was created is essentially garbage compared to streams, right? Streams are just that awesome. Uh, and let's show you an example of, of how that works. <laughs> Those who are familiar here with, uh, with Linux, um, must have done something like this where you know, you tail a log file and then grep it for a certain pattern, right? Uh, and if you look at what's actually happening, what, what Linux is actually doing is it's taking the standard out from your first application, which is tail, uh, you know, taking the standard out from that and then connecting that into the standard in using this pipe operator, let's call it an operator, I don't, I don't think it's an operator, but you know, connecting that into the standard in of grep and then it's running a pattern over that, right? So that's what's happening over here. So, Dhananjan, you were talking about building network applications that can be composed together of smaller applications. I think this is what they must have been referring to. Where so they are really deposed over the network. Right, right. So you, would have, so, you would have data coming in from different sources from across the network and then you would sort of piece them together by, by using small, small applications that are really doing each piece. So, you know, to give you an example, here is one where I'm reading something from uh, a file and I'm piping that to a response. So let's say you want to download a huge file, right? I'm reading something from disk and I'm flushing that over your HTTP response. So that's how you are able to download the file, right? Again, uh, obviously none of this is being held in memory. This is very, very efficient memory wise, right? Because it's just chunk after chunk that you're reading and you're writing and you're reading and you're writing. It's essentially, under the word, it's just the event emitter pattern, but it's been packaged differently 
to appear you know more elegant as compared to uh, the ugly Levita metal coat that we were looking at so far, right? And people have gone crazy with this. There's there's amazing stuff that's happened. People have written proxy servers that's one line of code. You know, essentially just take stuff from there, go make a request, and then pipe that over the response, right? That's it. And so it's just one line of code that's a proxy server. It's just very very elegant. Um, but uh, yeah, I have to add that. Uh, it's just it's just very very elegant. I just love how beautiful it is. Sadly, um, you know, streams aren't quite all that ready yet. Uh, it's very hard to build a stream. A stream that is pipeable uh, is very hard to build. It's hard. So these you know the streams that you can pipe from one location to the other is called a read stream. So it's you know that's one type of a stream. There's also a write stream, which is one that can accept data. So there's the read stream and the write stream. Uh, and then there are read write streams, streams that can both accept and you know spit out data. Uh, and these are very hard to build. Uh, and you know, 0 0.9 and uh, uh, 0 0.10. Uh, this probably going to be a 0 0.10 for Node, which is a very weird number to have. But you know, whatever. 0 0.10. They say that their focus is going to be streams, and their focus is going to be to to fix the API for streams and to make it really elegant. Uh, if you look at GitHub.com/Isaacs, there's already a lot of a uh, uh, couple of ideas that he's already toying around with uh, to make streams better, uh, easier to work with. Uh, Isaacs is the man, he's the guy who builds Node, right? So uh, he's got a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, let's be a little forgiving. These are early days for streams. Streams are, are barely about, you know, less than a year old. So, you know, there's a lot still to be uh, evolving in the stream space. Go ahead. Uh, will it support reviewable upload and download uh, of, I mean, uh, out of box? Uh, so that's the thing is that, well, it or you can already do upload and download out of the box. Uh, I, this was an example where you can do download, right? Yeah, this is, this is an example. So resumable, the problem is that uh, to do that, it's entirely possible to do that, no doubt about it. But to do that, it's actually a lot of work, which was my first point over here saying the streams are hard to, hard to build, right? So it's entirely possible to do that. Your code will look very elegant after you have done all the hard work. But doing that hard work is what is difficult. So right now it's not, you know, it's not there yet. It's not very beautiful yet. Um, so, but you know, it's something to watch out for in the future. I think that in the future, this is what will become the most interesting piece in Node. Go ahead. Same question uh, regarding this. Uh, Node.js is using a networking, so so its peer-to-peer -peer communication can be totally replaced by this thing or not? Same thing. Peer-to-peer communication. Peer -peer communication totally reduce. Uh, Reduced by these things, uh, that same thing that you can download it after some time or re resume it any time. So, if it is in networking, we are using a networking model. We can directly build into the system and resume after some time. If uh, connection goes lost, okay, uh, we'll stop there, mm -hmm. then read again from the disk and then flush again into the disk. Is that I possible into sure. future? I'm I think sure I I've read IEEE paper of 2010 uh, about the node days. Right. I think that same same concept was that about mm. this thing right. uh, that you are using in networking scheme, networking thing. No. Um, I I I don't know. I will have to. I guess I'll have to sit down and understand. Uh, you know the scenario that you're talking about. Uh, we let's let's take that up. You know right after this talk because I I don't want to sort of get everyone sitting down and listening to that. But that's interesting. Let's uh, I I want to explore what that what that means. Um, cool. Any other questions so far? Um, and yeah, so that was the point. My point was not about Node. My point was not about uh, uh, you know about browsers. It was not like married to any one of them. My my larger idea was that you know the fact that there is activity happening on both sides of the of the network is is helping improve APIs for everyone, right? So so now these kind of things are starting to happen on the browser. Socket.io is an example of that. Uh, but in general, people are building, you know, uh, much better APIs. There are so many things now when you think about it that can be dealt with in terms of streams or in terms of event emitters or in terms of, you know, simple uh, callback passing style on the browser that it's it's just beautiful. You know, things like uh, there's now file system APIs that are available in the browser and you could think of that in terms of streams. There is uh, web sockets, of course, which which we have already talked about, which is which you can think of in terms of streams. Uh, there is also the uh, event stream uh, spec, if you are aware of, uh, which is called server sent events in some cases. You know, so that's another case where streams are really useful. Um, there is also, you know, plain old Ajax where there is data coming down over the wire, and you can sort of deal with it in chunks. So that's another case where 
you know, there's data that's happening asynchronously. Uh, and then, of course, you know, things like uh, button clicks and, you know, form uploads, you know, these kind of things can also be thought of in terms of events. So, we, we probably in the next about six months to a year, I think that there will be new frameworks that will come out that will start using APIs that mirror nodes API very closely. There are already some attempts done. I, I recommend you look at uh, work by this guy called Max Ogden. Uh, uh, you know, he's been doing some very interesting work where he's building client APIs that actually mirror uh, node, ser node server APIs. It's very interesting to work with those in terms of, you know, it's the same sort of paradigm that you're using on both ends. So that's very interesting. Uh, and this is uncharted territory, more or less. So, you know, if you are a good client side developer and you are familiar with Node, give this a shot. You could be the next guy who's doing this, right? It's very interesting. Uh, and you probably should. And that's a wrap. That's all for me. Uh, thanks, you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Uh, if you have any questions, of course, uh, and if you're too shy to ask me right now, you can, you know, catch up later. Go ahead. Uh, this is one of my first events like this, so only one question of the topic. Since when are people giving presentations in the browser? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's been going on for quite some time. Uh, uh, congrats, congrats on your first event. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, but yeah, people have been giving. So this this particular one is by this guy called uh, Hakim. Hakim dot is very popular on the interwebs for his work on uh, uh, you know generally about graphics and stuff like that. He's he's one crazy guy. Uh, this one this I think this is called reveal dot js. Reveal dot js. So this is the also built an IDE for it now. Yeah, there's an IDE for it now as well. So it's amazing. There's uh, one more like impress dot js. So impress has impressionist, which was created by a guy in Bangalore. Oh. Yeah, he works at Adobe. And uh, reveal is by Hakim, who built his own ID. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, my question is specific to sockets. So, mostly something that interests me about Node.js is the sockets part. Right. Uh, but when we talk about sockets, uh, we are also considering the hardware interrupt that the socket is going to invoke. Right. right? right. Which is pretty resource intensive. So, how does, uh, how gracefully does Node handle that? Uh, like, is Possibly Node is like designed for that. I'm uh -huh. not sure about that. I'm uh, quite unclear about that. So, uh -huh. does uh, Node handle that quite gracefully, or is there something else that needs to be? I'm not the right person for that question, unfortunately, because I don't know too much about what's going on over there. Most of that code is in C land, and C for me uh, is like is like alien speak. I you know I, I can't understand C. Uh, <laughs> I just like there's just too many pointers flying around for me to make sense of it. <laughs> uh, but but you know uh, I just want to make a quip about the fact. Ranjay was talking about you know the worst language you said it was PHP. I'm surprised because no, the maximum WTF was was PHP. Is it? Oh, yeah. I didn't say it because of the popularity. I because I'm surprised because this Perl still exists. Right? So I'm surprised <laughs> 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 because I can't distinguish. You know, I don't I don't know when Perl stops and a regular expression starts. I can't make all the difference. Or I think a cat walking over the keyboard could be valid Perl code. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> So I have a question about so uh, about a paradigm when you have a system where you want to broadcast a message to let's say fifty thousand simultaneous users. Right. Uh, so far, I'm not able to find uh, an elegant solution for this. So it it works very much as if I'm sending a message to fifty thousand users, where each message might be different. Right. Is there anything which could be done when the message is seen when it is broadcast? Something called multicast for that. Uh, multicast. multicast, but even then, it uh, uh, below the uh, below the system, it works very much in the same way. You are essentially writing to each connection individually. Not necessarily. If your transport supports multicast, it's multicast all the way. So usually, ISPs don't support multicast yeah. at the consumer level. Yeah. But what happens is um, distribution services like Akamai. This is their primary business. Uh, I mean, apart from the caching business, uh, what they do is set up multicast servers at major ISPs around the world, mm -hmm. and they do a single cast to that edge point and from there it's split up into clients. Mm -hmm. Which means that your source server does not have to take all the load. Thanks, I didn't know that myself. <laughs> 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 that was something every day. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, back to the web socket part, I missed the initial uh, uh, session about that. Huh. Uh, is it TCP over HTTP or is it... Uh, 
Oh, uh, WebSocket, it's, it's, it's uh, I don't think anybody is sure anymore. It's just that spec has just changed so many times. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, it is not, it's not over HTTP. It negotiates over HTTP. It starts from HTTP and then it moves to a different, uh, it's almost like a TCP connection. HTTP after that. is a command that you can use to turn it into a WebSocket. Yeah, right. And uh, yeah, WebSocket does it. It says upgrade. It changes, yeah. like yeah. it changes the protocol. Yeah. 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 And how different it is in, I mean, the, they also claim that it is port sharing with HTTP. Yeah, because you make an HTTP connection and then tell it, okay, I want to convert it into WebSocket. Which means that your server, whatever you're using, must understand WebSocket, the con conversion uh, command. And uh, Apache does not support it, Nginx does not support it. Right. Okay, so, so uh, that's why you should use Node. <laughs> <laughs> So if, if the web server need to understand the, the socket uh, web socket protocol as such, then uh, you need to have some gateways in between. Um, so usually see the gateways are the ones that don't understand it. Like the popular gateways are what? Apache, Nginx. Neither of them understand web sockets. No, but there, there is one company called Kazing or something which they, they provide some web socket gateways for the other. That's because the popular ones don't support it out of the box, but there are patches. So you can patch your Nginx, build a custom version which has WebSocket support built in. And the thing is, because the WebSocket standard itself is not final, you know, it's been changing a lot over the years. So, which is the reason why Apache refuses to make it part of the official release because that means it's become a standard. Because Apache itself is so popular that once it's deployed, there's no hope of changing it. We can use HA proxy. HA uh, proxy can. Go ahead, go ahead. I think you can use HA proxy. In, in front of Apache, and that will sort out your WebSocket to the. And uh, you, I think uh, you've tried pubnub.com, or you were asking about 50,000 uh, broadcasting that message to 50,000 people. No, no that, that was for our system. Sorry? Um, we so failed that problem in our system. Ah, so there's this service called pubnub.com. So I think, and this is their specialization. They have this full infrastructure, they'll just give, give it to this other service, basically. So you can just try that pubnub.com and go and check it out. Mm -hmm. I was just saying that I think uh, recently Nginx committed to uh, supporting uh, web sockets in, in their latest build, so I think you should expect that. Is it in release? Yeah, uh, it's I guess part of their roadmap now. Yeah, but I guess it will again be a few months before it comes out in the next Ubuntu, which is uh, yeah, I'm sure. what most people end up using. Yeah, I'm sure. And the guys on LTS, no hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I have a question regarding uh, what sort of programming uh, style would you really like to use uh, with asynchronicity and all this stuff. So uh, what I what we see with Node is it's more about emitting events and callbacks, right? Uh, there's another style which I'm not quite familiar with, but uh, something called as promises. Uh, oh, so it makes it look very pro procedural kind of thing. It makes <coughs> it look very easy for the developer. Right. And I constantly thought about like adding a slide for that, but I forgot about like these. Uh, relatively less common patterns, but are there anyway? Uh, you know, futures, promises, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, by and large, I would recommend you should not use them simply because there are not enough people using them already. So uh, it must be a chicken and an egg problem. I'm not really sure if they are good or bad because I have not used them myself. But I would recommend that you don't use them anyway because it does not have enough mind share. There's not enough activity going on there. And in a lot of cases, you need to have buy-in, you know, that entire stack has to be using that, that mechanism. And so in a lot of cases, once you sort of take that decision, then you get stuck in that world and you will not be able to come out of that. So I would I would recommend that you don't go there usually. Yeah, Node has some kind of support for features and promises? No, it doesn't. People have, have done stuff with like working at the C level, working with event, uh, you know, stuff like that to make it possible. Uh, it's just... So there is stuff available, you know, for sure you could play with that if you want to. But there is not that has not managed to garner enough community support yet. So people are still playing with ideas like uh, callback passing and uh, and event emitters for now. It's okay for uh, like JavaScript developers who are pretty much used to callbacks and event emitting at yeah. the UI level, right? Absolutely. That's what we do in day in and day out. Yeah. Yeah. But what about someone else like coming in now that we are uh, pr projecting Node as the server language? Right. So what about like people coming in from Java or so people coming in from? So you know that that reminds me of of this thing that uh, Douglas Crawford said. Uh, that JavaScript is the one language that when you're starting uh, work in JavaScript, everybody thinks they don't need to learn the language, right? That's how it works. Everybody just opens their editor and starts writing JavaScript, right? Like, like everybody's a pro at JavaScript. That's what everybody assumes. Uh, and, you know, I don't know. I mean, when you're going to learn Java, you would learn how Java works, right? You would figure out what the idioms in Java are. You would figure out, you know, what design patterns you should use in Java. 
But somehow, when you come to JavaScript, you don't bother doing that. You know, you just think that, oh, I know Java, so I obviously know JavaScript, you know, and so I'm going to do JavaScript, right? The way I'm used to doing it in Java. And so, uh, I think, I think you know, uh, and it's true that there are, there are more people than not who do that. Honestly, I did that myself when I came to JavaScript, so, you know.